I want to acknowledge the indigenous owners of this land and ask their permission to speak. And also to ask for their mana for this conference, which we got this morning, um, a few minutes ago when Mr. Warner opened um, welcomed us. As it is typical with Tongans, they surprise you. They want to, they always love to surprise you. So Opa told me I was going to give a keynote, so I spent weeks preparing my keynote speech. And then today he said, you're going to, you're the guest speaker at the dinner. Um, so when I'm surprised, I'm pretty nervous. And the only thing that makes me not nervous is to read some poems. Because that is what I do in my spare time when I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing at the University of the South Pacific. I am known in the Pacific Islands for my poetry rather than for my academic work. So many of the Pacific students who come to university have had to put up with having to study my poems in school. I used to be an English teacher and I was horrified when the principal asked me to teach English. I had gone to New Zealand to study at university, history and geography, so that I could come back to Tonga and teach those subjects. I arrived at Tonga High School and the principal, Mr. Seely, said, well, you have a BA, therefore you are going to teach English. And I said, but I didn't major in English. Well, but you went to university. Thanks. This was typical of the old days in the islands because we didn't have too many students who went to university. And I was horrified because I hated English with a passion when I was a student at high school. I told Opa that I almost failed English. In fact, I did fail. I did 48% for, for English, school certificate, English. So when I came back and I was asked to teach English, a subject that I hated, and I taught the curriculum that I had to study, I thought to myself, I want to make sure that my students did not hate English. So I started to dabble in poetry. I took up a class in creative writing at the University of the South Pacific Center in Tonga. Tonga was the first um, center or campus outside of Fiji for the University of the South Pacific. For those of you who don't know, it's a regional university owned by 12 countries of the, of the Pacific Islands, Fiji being the, the biggest. So I am based in Fiji, and I am now the longest serving teacher at the university, having started there in 1974. But I started to write poems in order to make English literature, particularly poetry, meaningful for my students, who also, like me, hated studying English. And I found that doing that, writing about things that they could relate to, help them to understand the prescribed text. So I have been writing poems ever since, and I haven't stopped. So I'd like to read a few. I've, I've had a five collections now, but I just want to share with you some of my poems. I don't want to make a big speech, but just to share with you, because I think, I think some of you like me, um, struggle at school, and I want to talk about that tomorrow, about how most Pacific Island students of Africa people struggle with education. It's a continuous struggle, and we're still struggling. 
because there's not many parts of the world where you go to school from early childhood to university and have to learn in a foreign language. That's pretty daunting for anybody. So I read a couple, share with you a couple of my poems. Um, the first one is this one I want to dedicate to the people who organize this conference. I think the Palanoa methodology, as we heard, is a very useful one. But there are lots of cynics who say that, oh, we are just Palanoa. Palanoa can also be gossip. We just, we just want to come and talk for nothing. They don't know that Palanoa is meaningful. So I want to congratulate the organizing committee for instituting this method of learning, this method of teaching. And this one is called We Dare. And I think this committee is very daring. Why do we dare to build dreams doomed to disappear when rain clouds fall? Morpheus knows us well, is aware of our minds, mildly mocking our moods. He feels the intertwining of our hair our hands strong, yet incapable of containing the heat of the sun. We run uphill to meet our fate in the fast-spinning wheel of love, chained to each other by a constant spiritual cord. We dare to dream it all. When the north wind blows our mirrored souls, scattering our hopes beyond the horizon, yet gathering the morning mist as an offering to the spirit that binds us. It is the spirit that's binding all of us here today. And we dare to dream that we can help Pasifika young people to improve their education and strive for their life. The next one is when I wrote to, to illustrate to my students that part of the problems that they have in education is that their teachers do not understand, or most of their teachers, particularly at university, do not understand that they have a different way of thinking from them. Many, many teachers assume sameness among their students, whether they're teaching in school or they're teaching at university. So when we paranoia with the lecturers, with my colleagues, and I tell them that our speaker students are struggling because the expectations of the university are quite different from the expectations of their culture, and that they should treat them differently, they say to me, no, we treat all our students the same. So it is this, this response inspired me to, to pen this little poem. It's called Thinking. You say that you think, therefore you are. But thinking belongs in the depths of the earth. We simply borrow what we need to know. These islands, the sky, the surrounding sea, the trees, the birds, and all that are free. The misty rain, the surging river, caused by the blowholes, a hidden flower, they have their own thinking. They are different frames of mind that cannot fit in a small, selfish world. The next one is something I wrote about um, 
Again, because I deal so um, in my daily work, I deal with specific island students at the university. I can see them going through the, the struggles that I went through as a student, as a young student in New Zealand, where I did my university studies. And one of the things I remember about my university studies was thinking that my, my culture and all my cultural learning was useless for university. And we have a saying in Tonga, if you are from an aristocratic family, I am a commoner, that when you go to school, school is the leveler, education is the leveler. And if you are a chiefly person and you come to school, the teachers will say to you, hang your chiefness in the tree out there. Leave it by the gate. You come here and you are no longer a chief. As a student in Auckland, I felt that that was what I was doing. I hung up my culture at the gates of the university because it had nothing to do with my studies. I went back to Auckland to speak at a conference at the University of Auckland where I went to school, where I was a student. And I thought, well, things, how things have changed. This one is called Weekend in Auckland. A weekend in Auckland is good for this, well, we could say a weekend in Brisbane. You can substitute Brisbane for that, those of you who had to go to school in Brisbane. A weekend in Auckland is good for discovering again old meeting places in the park, hoping they had stories to tell about the adventures of a once youthful time. Down under the magnolia trees, the bench which took the weight of our first kiss is still there. The fountain continues to beat like an artificial heart, and the flowers continue to die with each passing day. And there, hovering high above, is the tower clock, now dwarfed by the reality of its own time. The striking shadow, a reminder that the heart's best defense at this time is forgetting. I'll just read the last one because I think the food is here. <laughs> this one is probably my most popular poem among the young people in the Pacific Islands. It is also the one poem that I suppose um, helped me to create an international profile, if you like. And I say that because it's the, my one poem that has been translated into Chinese. You know, there are millions of people in China, so if your work is translated into Chinese, you can imagine how many people would read your work. So, I will read this because this is the poem that set me off, if you like, in my creative writing career. But I'm particularly proud of it because it was translated into Chinese. But you know, it's called You the Choice of My Parents. But the Chinese version had it as You the Choice of My Father. And when I asked the professor who did the translation why he made the father, he said, this is to contextualize your poem into Chinese culture because it is the father who decides who you marry. So I didn't argue because at least it got translated into Chinese. You, the choice of my parents. You come clad in your fine mats and tupper cloth, your brown skin bursting with fresh perfumed oil, your eyes shining like stars in a clear night. You, the choice of my parents. You will bring them fame and wealth with your Western-type education and second-hand car. 
But you do not know me, my prince, saying that I am firstborn and have known no other man. I fit your plans and schemes for the future. You cannot see the real me. My face is masked with pretense and obedience, and my smiles tell him that I care. I have no other choice. The priest has left the altar now, and the dancing has begun. I see myself dying slowly to family and traditions, stripped of its will and carefree spirit, naked on the cold and lonely waters, but strange family shoreline, alienated from belonging truly. I love as a mere act of duty. My soul is far away, clinging to that familiar ironwood tree that heralds strangers to the land of my ancestors. I will bear you a son to prolong your family tree and fill the gaps in your genealogy. But when my, sorry, but when my duties are fulfilled, my spirit will return to the land of my birth, where you will find me no more, except for the weeping willows along the shore. Oh, wow.